Hello, friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN. HN merch button. Click on that. It'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that, hey, on the swag that I'm using, it's the headquarters of sports yesteryear, Sports History Network, and my favorite podcaster, the Sports History Network store. Shop there today. Magic That's look. It, it, it says to Kareem, come on down here, big fella, put in a chair. The crowd stands for Kareem to get the ball. Everybody's waving their arms. It's in the Kareem. Kareem swing left, right hand, 12 footer, good! The new king of scoring has ascended his throne. What an emotional moment. And the kind of a shot that I dreamed about for three weeks that he would make, Keith. The hook shot. The sky hook is the shot that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar used to break Will Chamberlain's all-time NBA regular season scoring record. He then held on to that record for nearly 39 years until LeBron James broke that record a couple of weeks ago. But why does nobody else shoot the sky hook when Kareem demonstrated its incredible effectiveness? It was this shot that gave him the all-time scoring record. We are going to answer that question today. This is a story of Kareem's sky hook, and this is Basketball History 101. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to the award-winning Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is a podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. We are bringing old-school basketball to a new-school audience. And today, we try to answer the question of why nobody shoots the sky hook anymore. I mean, I guess a better way to phrase that question is, why did nobody except Kareem shoot the sky hook ever? I mean, seriously, the guy was the NBA's all-time leading scorer for 39 years because of that shot and nobody else copied it. If you watch the NBA for any length of time, then you know that the NBA is a copycat league. But the phenomenon is not exclusive to basketball. Pretty much in any sport, whether it's baseball, football, rugby, hockey, or anything else, if anyone uses a strategy or skill that proves effective, it will be copied by others in very short order. Back in the 1980s, the San Francisco 49ers of the NFL won four Super Bowls using a style of offense known as the West Coast Offense, developed by their coach Bill Walsh. Now, once they won the first couple of Super Bowls with it, you suddenly saw other teams starting to adopt the offensive principles of the West Coast Offense. Walsh's assistant coaches were being poached every year by other teams to become their new head coaches on the condition that they bring the West Coast style of offense with them. They would even have press conferences where they would proudly announce that their team was going to start using the West Coast offense. The Chicago Bulls were winning NBA championships in the 1990s with the Triangle offense. That offense was developed in part by their assistant coach Tex Winter for his Kansas State University teams back in the 1950s. And that offensive style used by the Bulls completely dominated the NBA for nearly a full decade. So the Dallas Mavericks wanted to copy it. They hired away Bulls assistant assistant coach Jim Clemens to be the new head coach of the Dallas Mavericks as long as he brought the triangle offense with him. And at the press conference, they announced the signing of their new coach and they also very proudly announced that the Mavericks were going to start running the triangle offense. It did not work. But that is not really the point. The point is that the teams copy whatever works by other teams. It also works on the individual skill level. When Michael Jordan was destroying everybody in the 1980s with his incredible athletic dunks, everyone wanted to start dunking. Kids at the playground became obsessed with the dunk because of Michael Jordan. They did so at their own detriment, and they stopped working on their jump shot because all they wanted to do was dunk it. But then everything changed. 
Enter Steph Curry. He took the art of the three-point shot and took it to a whole new level. Now every kid wants to shoot the three-pointer to the exclusion of everything else that would be considered part of a complete offensive arsenal. I used to coach youth basketball for about 10 years when my three kids were little. I clearly remember all of my young players, typically aged 6 through 12 depending on the year, and they all wanted to shoot the three. They would even say to me, coach, why don't we ever shoot the three? And they were asking this question with genuine curiosity. I mean, after all, the three-pointer seemed to be working for the Golden State Warriors, especially when they had Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, and Kevin Durant. I would answer my players with this. Because you can't make the three. You are all eight years old. You throw the ball at the rim like a baseball, and the ball doesn't even reach the rim. Why would I run a play for that? Now, I would then tell the players that they are going to run the set plays involving a series of screens to give the dribbler an easy layup. And they would still miss half of those point blank layups. I mean, after all, they were seven and eight years old and half of these kids were severely lacking in athletic gene. Again, my bigger point here is that all sports players and coaches copy the best strategies and skills. Kobe Bryant's fadeaway shot looked exactly like Michael Jordan's fadeaway. I mean, of course it would. That shot worked. Later, Dirk Nowitzki shot his fadeaway off of one foot with the opposite knee raised up to help keep the defender away. Now, Kevin Durant shoots his fadeaway the same way that Nowitzki did. Steve Nash gave the layup a nice twist. If he could beat his man off the dribble with a quick step, he would then slow down in order to keep the defender on his back, shielding the defender with his left hand, while he would extend his right arm really far out and do more of a scoop layup with his right hand. It proved extremely effective for the shorter Nash going against really tall defenders. Now, nearly every shorter guard in the NBA will use that same scoop layup when going against a much taller defender. It's copied because it works. So I ask the question again, why has nobody else shot the sky hook the way Kareem did? I mean, that shot was arguably the most unstoppable shot in basketball history. Here is what Kareem has to say about it. The reason that uh Young kids today don't learn how to shoot hook shots is because everybody is so enamored with the three-point shot. They want to go out there uh, in the stratosphere and shoot three-pointers. For the longest time, that did not work as solid basketball strategy. But now, uh, Stephen Curry, I've never seen anybody shoot like that. They showed Stephen uh, shooting 100 three-point shots in practice. He, he made 92 out of 100. So uh, anybody that can shoot like that is uh, on a different plane <laughs> from uh, all the guys that I played against and the people that I saw when I first started watching the game in, in 1960. But they're not teaching the young kids how to score in the paint uh, with their back to the basket and therefore they don't, uh, a lot of them don't get to learn the hook shot and they don't get to realize that uh, if you get close to the basket, a lot more of your shots will go in. So Kareem's thought about it is that the sky hook is not cool. And in one sense, it isn't cool, but it works. So why does nobody else shoot it? Well, this is a good place to take a break and I'll be right back to try to answer that question. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique Unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876, including t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, phone cases, mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com, R-O-W number one, for access to the full Row One catalog and for gallery prints and gift items, plus get a 15% discount off all prints on the Row One Pictorum Gallery with coupon code SHN15. Follow the link on the show notes. Hi, everybody. Dan and Andrew from Hello Old Sports here. We wanted to drop in and let you know about our latest episode. That's right. We interviewed the co-authors of Phyllis George, Shattering the Ceiling, a biography of groundbreaking broadcaster Phyllis George. 
And her life is really sort of a journey through 20th century America, from Miss America pageants to the Kentucky State House to the groundbreaking NFL Today show on CBS, even the Kentucky Colonels, the old ABA. We got into all sorts of stories about the Celtics under Red Auerbach, about the interview with Roger Staubach, about really all sorts of things, a fight between Brent Musburger and Jimmy the Greek. We really enjoyed talking with Lenny Shulman and Paul Volponi, who teamed up to write this book. The book is on sale right now wherever books are sold, but, but, you know, within reason. Garage sales, probably not. So go <laughs> ahead and pick up a copy today. And if you want a chance to win the book, you can go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash giveaways and register for a chance to win. Goodbye, old sports. Welcome back to the show, and let us continue with trying to answer the question about why nobody else shoots Kareem's shot, the sky hook. Right before the break, Kareem himself said that the reason nobody shoots the hook shot is because it is not a cool shot like the dunk or the three-pointer. Post-play has a diminished place in the game of basketball, especially in the NBA. Everything today is about space and pace. That means that having multiple three-point shooters on your team to force the defense to spread out to cover everyone. On top of that, you also play fast, trying to get off a good three-point shot within the first 10 seconds of the shot clock. But that does not answer the question about why a player does not shoot the sky hook, especially back in Kareem's day. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar entered the NBA in the fall of 1969 with the Milwaukee Bucks. Back then, he was still going by his original name, Lou Alcindor. He changed his name after converting to Islam and was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar by his third season in the NBA. In any case, here is a list of the other Hall of Fame big men that played against Kareem during his 20 years in the NBA. Willis Reed, Elvin Hayes, Nate Thurman, Wilt Chamberlain, Wes Unseld, Bob Lanier, Dave Cowens, Dan Issel, Bob McAdoo, Moses Malone, Bill Walton, Artis Gilmore, Jack Sikma, Robert Parrish, Kevin McHale, Ralph Sampson, Akeem Olajuwon, and Patrick Ewing. None of them copied Kareem's sky hook. Now, each one of these guys might have increased his scoring by an average of four to eight points per game if they had just learned the sky hook. But then again, maybe these guys did not bother to learn the sky hook because each of these guys was a dominant big man in his own right and did not feel that they needed the sky hook. And I can accept that answer if that is truly the answer. But what about the average to above average big man that was trying to become an all-star or only went to a couple of all-star games? Guys like James Donaldson, Bill Lane Beard, Tom Chambers, Brad Doherty, or Michael Thompson. I'm sure that each of these guys could have elevated his game to a consistent all-star level and maybe even a Hall of Fame level if they had just learned to shoot the sky hook. But none of them did. The thing about the sky hook is that it is a shot that is easy on the body. I do not mean to say that it is easy to master, even Kareem admits that it is a difficult shot to master, but it does not require a lot of athleticism for the shot to work. I know that I am making this sound easier than it really is, but the player spins to his left or right and then take a short one foot jump and arcs the ball over the defender's outstretched hand. It is the kind of shot that a player can shoot very effectively late in his career. The dunk puts a lot of wear and tear on a player's body. Even Jordan and Kobe were not dunking the ball all that much in their later years. As they got older, they relied more on their fadeaway shots and mid-range jumpers. But the sky hook can be used by an older player to great success. In my opinion, it was a sky hook that allowed Kareem to become the very first player to play season number 18, season number 19, and season number 20. It extended his effectiveness. And when you watch old film of Kareem, he would jump really high in his younger days and practically shoot the ball on a straight downward angle into the rim. But as he got older, he was not jumping as high. Therefore, he was putting more of an arc on the shot so that the ball could clear the defender's hand. But my point is that even at the age of 42 years old, the sky hook still worked for Kareem because it was a shot that can work very well for an older player. Again, did I mention that the sky hook has been described as the unstoppable shot? So, in the final analysis, I will say this in an effort to answer the question that I have placed on the table. Why has no one else adopted the sky hook? For the current players, it is because it is not a cool shot. They would rather dunk it or shoot it from three. But for the players back in Kareem's day, I think the answer is because it took hours upon hours of practice to really master the shot with either hand. 
Kareem talks about having spent many, many hours in the gym perfecting that shot. And maybe most big men are not willing to put in that time that it takes to learn it. And let us be honest, it looks like the kind of a shot that an old man takes. I'm not blind to this. I guess for many players, it is better to look cool than be effective. And it still boggles my mind that we do not see it elsewhere. I mean, we do see hook shots and most big men have mastered a basic hook, but the sky hook, as the way Kareem shot it, has never been copied at all in NBA basketball. And that is a shame. Well, that does it for today. Join us next time when we share the story of one of the biggest underdogs to find success in the NBA. Bob Cousy. Today we know him as a Hall of Fame point guard, the guy who created the blueprint for all modern point guards. I mean, the guy was a league MVP, but when he was coming out of college, virtually nobody wanted him. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the football history dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network. And we're able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history. But as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment. You know that. Can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you gotta do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.